Hi, everyone. First of all, I want to thank the IMP and the Max Bernstein Foundation for selecting me for this award. It's a great honor to be here and a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present my research to you. And so as a thank you, I will start by showing you pictures of cute animals. These are all mammals. However, they're very different, both in terms of morphology and behavior. However, what is surprising is that if we look into their genomes, we see that they share a very large fraction of their protein coding genes. And also that the sequences of these genes are overall very similar between species. Where these species do differ a lot is in the remaining 98% of their genome that does not encode for proteins. And of course, a large fraction of this might be completely devoid of any function. But hidden in there, we have elements that give rise to non-coding RNAs, and also DNA regions that have a function on their own. They regulate the expression of nearby genes. And so the aim of my PhD was to identify such non-coding elements and to characterize their contribution to the development and evolution of mammalian organs. I started by looking into long non-coding RNAs, which are this group of transcripts that do not encode for proteins, they're quite heterogeneous and poorly understood. And the idea here was to utilize a large-scale transcriptomic data set that we had generated in the lab, covering the development of several organs in seven species to identify long non-coding RNAs that could play roles in mammalian organ development based on their expression profiles and their evolutionary conservation. And there is much more to say about this project. However, for this talk, I will focus on my more recent work on cis-regulatory elements. So cis-regulatory elements, such as enhancers and promoters, are regions in the genome that contain short sequences, which are recognized by transcription factors that bind to them and in turn activate the expression of adjacent genes. And the idea is that the same target gene can be regulated by different enhancers at different transcription factors in various cell types and developmental stages. So how can we identify these regulatory elements at the genome-wide level? There are different methods, and one that has become very popular in the last few years it's called the assay for transposase accessible chromatin, or ATAXIC in short. And the idea here is that when a cis-regulatory element is active, it's marked by an open chromatin environment that we can use to target an enzyme, in this case a transposase, to insert short barcodes to the region that we can later use for selective amplification of the locus and sequencing. And so at the genome-wide level, we're able to recover putative cis-regulatory elements as regions of open chromatin where we get a lot of transposition events. And a major advantage of ATAXIC compared to previous technologies is that it is very sensitive. So it has become possible recently to extract this kind of information from single cells. And this allows us to study processes such as uh, cell fate specification and differentiation, and to eventually compare these processes between different species. So in the lab, we decided to use this method to study the chromatin accessibility profiles of single cells in the development of the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the region in the back of our brain that is primarily known to be associated with motor control, but which is actually involved in other complex functions as well. And the reason that we're interested in the cerebellum in the lab is that in our previous work, we have found many genes that show radical expression changes during development. So we think that this is actually a region that is underappreciated in terms of brain evolution. We decided to start by studying the mouse. So I teamed up with Mari Sepp, who is a postdoc in the group, and we profiled around 90,000 cells using single nucleus ataxic across the developmental stages. So starting from the beginning of neurogenesis on embryonic day 10, all the way to adulthood. And the first challenge in this data set was to use the data to identify the major cell types that are present during the development of the cerebellum. And the way this works is that every dot you see in this plot represents a single cell. And cells with similar chromatin accessibility profiles are grouped together into clusters. We can then link these clusters to cell types and states using gene scores. So we aggregate the accessibility around a gene as a proxy for its expression. And then we can compare to known marker genes from databases and literature. And so using this approach, we were able to identify all the major cell types in the cerebellum. However, as you can see here, in very different proportions during development. And I will not go into details about the cell types that we found here. I just want to highlight two major neuron types that are perhaps the most famous in the region and also they're quite remarkable overall. So they attracted actually the attention of one of the fathers of neuroscience more than a century ago. So we have Purkinje cells, which are one of the largest neuron types in the brain. They're characterized by this massive network of dendrites. And as you can see, they're generated uh, during prenatal development. And then we have granule cells, which are very small, but extremely abundant. They are the most abundant neuron type in the brain. They make up more than 50% of our neurons in the, in the brain. And as you can see, they go through this phase of secondary amplification during postnatal development. So that's when they, their numbers really rise. 
So after identifying the major cell types in this data set, the next step was to look for putative CIS regulatory elements and to examine profiles across uh, cell types and developmental stages. And as you can see, we have very few CREs that are broadly accessible throughout the data set. These are mostly promoters. We have some that are shared across many, but not all cell types. And these are more prominent in early development. But really, the vast majority of the CREs are specific to a single cell type and also to a restricted developmental window, highlighting the overall context specificity of gene regulation. Now, we also did some analysis on uh, progenitor cells and cell fate specification. I will skip this in the interest of time. And I will jump to the next step, which is what happens after cell fate commitment. So immature neurons still have to grow an axon. They have to migrate to their final position in the cerebellum. They have to form a functional synapse. And collectively, we refer to these uh, processes as neuronal differentiation. So the question here was, how do the chromatin accessibility profiles of these cells change during this process? And this is something we can model with our data. We can align cells across multiple developmental stages along a common axis of variation, and then use a metric called pseudotime to rank cells from progenitor cells to mature neurons. And we can repeat this for multiple cell types. And immediately, we notice a difference in the dynamics of this process. So in granular cells, we have continuous neurogenesis, so multiple differentiation states present uh, across multiple developmental stages. Whereas in Purkinje cells, we have a stage-restricted mode where almost all the change happens within a couple of days, embryonic days 12 and 13. And after that point, the chromatin accessibility profiles of these cells remain largely unchanged. Now, despite this difference in the dynamics of the process, when we look into the CREs that change their accessibility during differentiation, we see a convergence in terms of biological processes. So we start with CREs that are close to genes associated with uh, pattern specification, move to terms like uh, migration, synapse assembly, and eventually neurotransmitter secretion. And on top of the convergence in biological processes, we also see that many of the target genes of these CREs are directly shared across uh, multiple neuron types. Which now begs the question, do we also have CREs that are shared across uh, neuron types during the differentiation? And of course, as I showed you before, most of the CREs in the data set are cell type specific. And this is what we find here as well. So the assumption here is that the same target gene is activated by different regulatory elements, predominantly in different neuron types. However, we also did find some that are shared between different neuron types. And what is interesting with these is that they are typically active in similar stages of differentiation. So I'm showing you here an example of a CRE that is accessible in granules or progenitors, differentiating Purkinje cells and differentiating interneurons. And then the accessibility goes down in the mature neurons of all three cell types, which suggests that this CRE might be playing a shared role in the differentiation programs of multiple uh, cerebellar cell types. Now, another question we can ask is whether this degree of CRE sharing changes during differentiation. And for that, we can compare the fraction of CREs in different clusters, starting from early differentiation in orange to late differentiation in purple. And we see an enrichment of early CREs in the sets that are shared across two or more cell types in the data set. So in other words, the CREs that are shared across multiple cell types that are pleiotropic, they're more active in early differentiation, and the chromatin accessibility profiles of different neuron types gradually diverge during this process. And as I will show you in the next slide, this has profound implications for the evolution of these cis regulatory elements. So even though at the time we were working with one species, the mouse, we were able to compare to different vertebrate genomes to infer the age of CREs, so when did they appear during evolution, and also their constraints, so how much does the sequence change between different species. And the reason we're interested in this is that there was previous work, both from our group and others, showing that the evolutionary conservation of different genomic elements, such as enhancers, protein coding genes, long non-coding RNAs, decreases during organ development. And this has been seen for various organs. However, all these studies considered entire organs, so uh, averaging information across multiple cell types. So what we didn't know was whether we would see the same decrease within cell types or whether this pattern is due to changes in the cellular composition of the organ. So we can imagine a scenario where multipotent progenitors, which are overall abundant in early organ development, have more conserved CREs. And as their fraction goes down uh, during development, we also see this decrease in evolutionary conservation. And now with our data, we can test this because we can repeat the same analysis at the level of both cell types and developmental stages. And when we do that, we see that multipotent progenitors, uh, shown here as astroglia in purple, are not in fact different from self-aid committed cells. 
what we do see is a certain decrease of evolutionary conservation within all cell types. And with some additional analysis, we were able to show that this is very much related to this decrease in CRE sharing that I mentioned before. So the CREs that are shared across multiple cell types are overall more conserved. And as we have more of them in early organ development, uh, we also have a higher evolutionary conservation. Nevertheless, we also do find differences in constraint between cell types. And these are most prominent in the adult, where we see that astrocytes, surprisingly, have the most conserved CREs in the cerebellum, whereas microglia are diverging significantly faster than all the other cell types in the region. And I just want to clarify here that these differences do not contribute to the whole organ pattern that I mentioned before, because these cell types are very rare in the adult, and also they go in opposing directions compared to the average constraint uh, of the remaining cell types. Now, to validate these observations, we looked into another data set that considered uh, cell types in the adult mouse across a wide range of organs. And what we saw there was quite striking eight out of the 10 most conserved cell types in the adult mouse are actually found in the brain, which is consistent with the fact that the brain is a very slowly evolving organ. And so, therefore, astrocytes do not only have the most conserved CREs in the cerebellum or in the brain, but in the entire adult mouse, at least across the, the organs uh, that were sampled in this study. Now, at this point, you can say, well, this is all done at the level of CRE sequences. We don't know whether these regions maintain regulatory activity in the other species. So would we see the same patterns in terms of differences between developmental stages, differences between cell types, if we were to directly examine the conservation of CRE accessibility between species? And to answer this question, we looked into oh, this guy, an opossum, which is a marsupial that shared the last common ancestor with a mouse around 160 million years ago. So we profiled uh, the cerebellum of the opossum, found the same cell types as in the mouse, also in very similar uh, proportions uh, when considering corresponding developmental stages, and often on the basis of the same marker genes, highlighting overall that the, the cellular composition of the cerebellum is quite conserved across mammals. What we also saw was that corresponding cell types consistently showed the highest similarity in their chromatin accessibility profiles between the two species, even when considering intergenic series, which are known to evolve really fast, so overall, the cell type specificity of the series that are maintained during evolution seems to stay quite conserved. And then going back to this question about differences between cell types, we can now ask, what is the fraction of mouse series that we also find in opossum? And when we do that, we see that, again, astrocytes have the highest conservation in the cerebellum, and microglia are diverging significantly faster. So with this analysis, we're able to extend our previous uh, observations from the level of uh, series sequence conservation to the level of the conservation of uh, chromatin accessibility profiles. And um, I want to leave you with a glimpse to the future. I will not go into details, I'm sorry for, for this. But uh, so, so far, I mainly discussed the evolutionary conservation of non-coding elements. But of course, if we want to understand how they might contri uh, contribute to the differences that we find between species, we also have to consider evolutionary innovation, so changes that occur during evolution. And so for that, we have been working towards integrating single-cell RNA-seq and ataxic data sets across multiple species, indeed including human, marmoset, and the mouse, uh, throughout cerebellar development. And by now, we know that the cell types in the cerebellum are quite conserved. So we can compare gene expression profiles between corresponding cell types to identify genes that have changed their expression during evolution, and then use the chromatin accessibility uh, data to identify the series that are associated with these changes, and finally, the next step that we're working towards at the moment is to try to relate these changes in CRE accessibility to the sequences of the series themselves. So to understand which particular changes in the genomes of these species lead to the differences that we observe in terms of chromatin accessibility and gene expression. And this is a project that we're very excited about. And I hope that in the near future, we will also be able to, to share some results from this analysis with you. And so with that, I would like to thank my supervisor, uh, Henry Kessman, for his incredible support during my PhD. I also want to thank two very close collaborators who have been very important for these projects, uh, Margarita Cardoso Moreira and Mari Sepp, all the members of the Kessman Lab, all the other collaborators, the funding sources, and of course, all of you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions.